Welcome to the In Shape Fitness Show. I'm Coach Kim, and today's podcast is all about the New York City Marathon. This is the weekend that New York City pulls out all of the stops to host nearly 40,000, actually I think it might be more than 40,000 runners at this point, in the 2019 TCS New York City Marathon. And I'm talking today about about the race, the race course, some final tips as you might be getting ready to run this race or any other, actually, it doesn't really have to be uh, last minute tips for the New York City Marathon because these are kind of applicable concepts for any New York, any marathon uh, or half marathon Um, shorter races may you know sort of be strategically planned out in slightly different ways obviously the training for the New York City Marathon is over if you're not ready to run the race today you are definitely not going to be ready to run in terms of physically uh, run the race today it's not going to be the kind of race um, potentially that you you have, have planned for but if you have trained for the New York City or any marathon, the New York City Marathon or some other race that's 26.2 miles, the um, the day of or the weekend really before the last week even leading up to race day is full of excitement but also a lot of anxiety. Just yesterday, I'm, I'm a coach by the way for the charity that the New York City Roadrunners Club Uh, operates in New York City. It's called Team for Kids. And Team for Kids is this, uh, I think we're in our 20 or 25th year, uh, 2002, so 20th year of operating free youth running programs in predominantly New York City, the five boroughs of New York City. So not just Manhattan and sort of what most uh, non-New Yorkers know about New York, but Queens and Brooklyn and Staten Island and the Bronx, uh, all five boroughs of New York City, as well as around the country and the world. And, you know, if you if you have kids in public schools, you know that the emphasis on physical education has been dwindling over the last several generations. Uh, when I was a kid and I was in public school, we had gym at least twice a week. And then if you played sports, you were going to, you know, multiple sessions for, for before school, after school, and, and so on. Um, you know, and, and you were outside playing for a long recess every single day. And that's just not the way schools operate anymore. My daughter's in a public elementary school, and she gets to go to gym once a week. And oftentimes, recess is indoors if the weather is is inclement, which I guess I understand. But even when they go outside, they have to sit and listen to rules read to them. If they get into trouble or some someone in the the grade structure gets into trouble, they they all kind of are punished for um, for that. And and it's really frightening and sad that our kids aren't getting to move around as much as they should because they really do need to to move around. Um, so the Team for Kids charity of the New York City Roadrunners Club has kind of filled the gap a little bit in terms of physical activity and and uh, and sort of uh, it's teaching kids to understand how their bodies move um, whether they become runners or not is not the point it's about learning how to move the body and enjoying the movement of the body uh, obviously learning how to, to run correctly and then to understand things like pacing and breathing and so on um, are all parts of it a little bit too for the younger kids of course my kids in elementary school, so um, as we get older, we'll we'll know more. Um, but I coach a team of adults that get a guaranteed entry for the New York City Marathon uh, by raising money to uh, to to fund this program, and we raise somewhere around five to six, maybe seven million dollars a year in total for for these programs. So it's a really special thing that I get to do. And as a long distance running coach in general, it allows me to to work with people across the ability spectrum. So we see people that run, you know, three hour marathons, not that many, um, a few, although interestingly enough, I was talking to one yesterday who is is a competitive runner, not like a winning competitive runner, but definitely um, um, you know, a Boston Marathon qualifier, and we were talking about the nerves, um, but just the anxiety uh, leading into the morning of the the day of the race, um, and um, and how significant that is in terms of the planning for the event. Um, most of the runners that I coach are more like bucket list marathoners, the recreational marathon participant who doesn't necessarily go out aiming for 
you know, a particular time, but aiming to cross that finish line, run the 26.2 miles and, and get the medal and, and raise money for youth programs in the process, which is just amazing. Now, in New York City, the other component of being a participant in this particular race is getting to see New York City the way that you get to see it on race day. And it is amazing. And one of the reasons that it's amazing is that it starts in Staten Island and you run through all five boroughs, which is a sprawling, um, the five boroughs in New York City, a very sprawling uh, piece of of land uh, connected um, by lots of bridges and tunnels, um, you know, in terms of, of Manhattan and its sort of central point. But because of the way that the five boroughs are structured, we, uh, we're we able to create this route um, that does cover 26.2 miles and gets you to run through all five boroughs. So it's a tourist favorite in terms of, of tourism, physical fitness, tourism, marathoning, to, to come into New York City and participate in this in this event. We start in Staten Island and run across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which is a huge bridge that is two miles long, um, and it's quite a hill. So the very, very first part of the New York City Marathon is a hill. You go up for about a mile. Um, it's not a huge grade, but it is definitely an incline. And um, you got to get to the top of it, you know. Um, so your people, the one good thing about that is that the, the old idea of like running out too fast uh, for some people is not so not applicable in this case because you do have to run up the hill. So it does kind of keep the throttle on a little bit. Um, but the uh, the stretch across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge where you can look in across and you see the um, you can see the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. You can see into Brooklyn and up um, up the sort of side of uh, of the coastline as you head into Brooklyn, which is the the first sort of massive part of the the race. In fact, almost half of the first half of the race is that bridge trip, and then into and and into Brooklyn, uh, ending at the uh, what is that bridge called the um, I forget, Pulaski Bridge. It's called the Pulaski Bridge that takes you from Brooklyn into Queens because yet another canal. It's a canal that separates those two uh, portions of New York City. So the first 12 or first two miles and then the second 12 miles is really just Brooklyn. And then, uh, and then you're running into Queens and we run through a really quaint village called Long Island City and into Astoria and then we have to take yet another bridge. And, and the reason I'm mentioning these bridges, of course, if you've ever run over a bridge, you know that you have to go up and then you go down. New York City is a pretty flat landmass, but although there are some tricky and interesting hilly par- parts that I'll talk about in a minute, but the bridges themselves are all hills. So it makes the course seem like it might be easy if you don't look at the elevation, but if you look at the bridges, those bridges do, you know, take, um, make, create these, these inclines and then the corresponding declines, of course, on the other side, um, which is my first tip for any race that you run, not even, um, not even like half marathon, but going down to the, the 10 K or even the 5 K there are almost always elevation, uh, maps that you can look at when you sign up for a road race of any kind, and you should take a look at them. Uh, your pre- pre- preparation, your training for runs should include the same type of terrain conditions or similar con- terrain conditions as the event that you're planning to run. So if you're planning to run a 10K in Central Park, for example, we get runners to run Central Park. Um, That's basically one big loop around Central Park, and it is very hilly in Central Park, ironically. Um, So some ups, some downs, and and, um, they're not huge hills, but they're definitely there. So you want to prepare by knowing your course. One of the things that I did for a smaller race that I ran, a smaller marathon that I ran some years back was, and and I mean like 2,000 people were running this race. So I was actually able not just to run parts of the course, not just to bicycle parts of the course, but also to drive the course and to just sort of see the land before the event itself. So get to know 
the place where you're going to be running. That is definitely important. Obviously, for New York City marathoners, um, you've got you don't want to be on your feet if you're here in town and you're running New York City and you happen to listen to this podcast and you don't know the course. Um, you probably want to go online and do as much studying as you possibly can via – there are some virtual tours and, and those kinds of things. It's pretty sophisticated stuff with the New York City Marathon Group, the Roadrunners Club. But, um, um, but you don't want to be on your feet um, trying to uh, traverse parts of the race course at this juncture. It's just a little bit too late. But that is something to think about. Uh, when you are planning for any of these types of, of events. Um, so as I said, so we, we cross into Queens and then um, you go over this bridge called the Triborough, sorry, the Queensboro Bridge, the Queensboro Bridge, which is, is connecting uh, or connects Queens, the borough of Queens into Manhattan at, um, on the east side of Manhattan. And when you enter Manhattan, which is kind of the, the heart of the of New York City's community, um, its you know, uh, geographical landmass. You turn onto First Avenue and head north, and it is a sea of people. The spectator crowd for the New York City Marathon is probably one of the most unique parts of the New York City Marathon, and it's so exciting. It's so vibrant. Um, it's a little insane in parts, just the crowds. It's kind of, um, you know, obviously celebratory and really loud and exciting, but, you know, it's big-time crowds, so you, you just have to think about it in terms of that and, and find a good place on either side of the road if you're looking to, to cheer people on. We also, of course, can track runners if you're interested in tracking people uh, the, based on their, you know, their bib number. So you run up First Avenue, and this is uh, sort of a stretch, a longitudinal stretch running up First Avenue from about 60th Street all the way up to about 125th Street on First Avenue. And that's a couple of miles. And when you leave Manhattan, so there's it's like just all people. And then we run a bridge, another bridge. It's not over yet. There's actually another bridge after this, too. Um, a bridge called the Willis Avenue Bridge, which takes you out of Manhattan and into the Bronx. And the Bronx is just north of Manhattan. So we run in the Bronx, kind of a circuitous route to essentially say hello to the Bronx and then turn back and run across this other bridge, the last bridge, which is called the Madison Avenue Bridge, which takes you back into Manhattan. And then the race, you know, this is your mile at like mile 21, roughly, by this point. And you are, you know, if you haven't hit the wall, Depending on where you are in your training spectrum, you may have hit the wall quite a bit sooner on First Avenue, which, by the way, is a slight incline as well. Um, so it, it's not, it's very vibrant and wonderful because of the celebratory components of it, but it is a tiny little grade. So making your way all the way up to that Willis Avenue bridge, where then you have to take the other incline up over the bridge again, is, is hard, right? Um, and then you're mile 20, you're in the Bronx. Um, the um, the last six miles of a marathon is is known to be kind of like the last half of the race, right? So you you run the twenty miles, and for many runners, the maximum amount of run time for a particular long run, a single effort, would be twenty miles. Most of our runners, uh, and with Team for Kids, the charity runners that I coach, don't run any longer than that, um, and some don't even run that because of the amount of wear and tear on the body once you hit you know, three and a half, three to three and a half hours of run time. But that last 6.2 miles, the 10K at the end, is known as kind of the last half of a marathon for a particular reason because it's almost like you have to pretend that you've begun a new race. And I train people when they scope out their strategy for marathons. This is a really big part of it. And then you can do, use this sort of as the – in the first 20 miles, breaking that down into several smaller races too. But this last 6.2 miles is that last 10K, and it really has to be the start of a new race. So it's as much a mental trickery in your brain in terms of, of, of being able to endure the pain, to get through the wall, to keep going without, uh, without um, you know, slowing down, without dealing with the, the issues of 
of boredom, of starting to get cold and all those kinds of things that are going to happen to you physiologically. Um, anything, of course, that is significant and, and needs medical treatment, obviously that's completely different. But every runner, with the maybe exception of a couple of the really lead sort of, um, you know, protege um, savant type runners, every runner encounters this wall of some sort, the beast, as some people call it in ultra running, where you have to make the choices. You have to be conscious and cognizant of what you're going to do next. And to keep going is, is sometimes really hard. So you're in the Bronx when this happens. And then you go back to Manhattan over this last bridge, as I said, the um, Madison Avenue Bridge. And then when you get back into Manhattan, you go through a, period, uh, uh, a part of, of upper Manhattan called Harlem. Hopefully you've heard of Harlem. And, um, and Harlem is where I live, actually. Um, and Harlem is beautiful. There are, again, so many spectators where we run around this really beautiful, bucolic, um, townhouse-lined street around a, a park called the... Uh, has two names actually it's called Marcus Garvey Park and it's also called Mount Morris Park and and then you get to Fifth Avenue and Fifth Avenue is this really last long stretch again ironically you're going up north up First Avenue and there's a slight grade and then you travel south on Fifth Avenue but there's also a slight another grade another little um just a couple of percentage but very annoyingly sort of slight up incline as you have to run into central park and when you enter central park you enter at 90th street and turn into central park and head south where again the crowds are cheering you on and it doesn't matter if you are a three-hour marathoner a four-hour marathoner a five-hour marathoner or a seven-hour marathoner it will start to get dark around 5 o'clock because we set our clocks back. There's a, another really good tip um, just re- with respect to this particular event and you're planning for the weekend or planning for any road race. You know, Rest well, make sure that you get to sleep really early and get as much sleep as you possibly can the night before. Um, we all get up really insanely early because of the, the logistics and security measures that we have to take in New York City and starting in Staten Island. So people arrive at the start much earlier than they do at many other races. But um, but we do set the clocks back this weekend. So the, uh, the, the time that it gets dark later in the day is quite early. And uh, But it, it, it doesn't really matter. People are going to be with our runners until the very end and the um the the finish line and medals are handed out as I, i've been across the finish line around eight o'clock at night and there are still people getting uh coming through the finish coming through the shoot and getting their their medal um so once you're in central park though you do head south and as you get farther south what's great is that the crowds actually pick up because then we exit Central Park for a portion along Central Park South which is where all like these fancy hotels are and all these really fancy high rises and stuff and there are lots and tor- lots of tourists still cheering people on across to Columbus Avenue in this circle where there's a huge statue of, uh, of Christopher Columbus and then you go back into Central Park and finish um, uh, just up the uh, up the last little hill which is the finish um, is um, is next to this iconic place called tavern on the green and that is the end of the uh, of the new york city marathon a couple of other things to think about so i don't generally tend to think or, or to suggest to people that they try anything new on race day in fact if you talk to a coach and they suggest that you try something new then you should find another coach to talk to because you should absolutely do nothing new as you lead into a fairly significant event. And fairly significant event for a lot of people would be running a 5K or running a 10K. So if you're going to, to endeavor to compete with yourself, because this is just about competition for your own purposes, for your own um, mechanisms of health and, and mental acuity and determination to, to you know, go to – take it to the next level, take your health to the next level. Those are all things that you're, you're looking to achieve as a participant 
in in a road race aside from things like community because the community spirit is so much you know is so exciting in a marathon meeting all the people that are also doing this you know engaging in this really you know challenging physical endurance event and getting to know um, parts of New York City so there's a community component of it that's that's joyful but you've got to be honest uh, you know with yourself about this the significance of the of the um, uh, the physical challenges and so starting with a new you know running out with a new pair of shoes even for a short race not a good idea Um, trying something new to eat not a good idea trying on new clothing uh, not a not a good idea Um, so uh, you know just make sure that you have your plan have your plan ready to go and um, and you're going to have a really great day Um, even though, of course, it's going to be really hard, like so many things in life. Um, Making it hard and taxing yourself, taxing your body, taxing your brain doesn't mean that it isn't rewarding. In fact, it actually is uh, the the axis of of the uh, reward that you get is connected to the challenge of of a particular, um, you know, a particular endeavor. So, Embrace it all. Embrace the, the difficulty that it, you're going to have and try not to stress about it because when you have tension inside of your bloodstream, you're, you're emitting stress hormones um, in a sort of a panicky kind of uh, primitive way. I'll talk about breathing in one second because it connects to this. The thing that happens with that pumping of a uh, cortisol into your bloodstream, your muscles don't work as well. So if you have a lot of anxiety and you're really really struggling with it you're not able to get to sleep you're not able to rest and and therefore you're um um you know you're you're really you know not completely prepared that means your performance is going to be affected and so you you know whether it's reading a relaxing book taking a relaxing bath getting um you know having a foot massage or a back massage or um, just sitting in silence, in meditative kind of silence, you want to develop a plan for making yourself, you know, get, trying to get yourself to be as relaxed as possible leading up to the, the start of the race. Um, that really applies to longer races, I think, much more than, than shorter races because of the, of the physiological burden you place on your body. With shorter races, you can get by with some of those stress hormones. They might even actually help you. But when you're out there for several hours, it is um, it's important that you uh, you don't add anything into your bloodstream that that um, inhibits the action of your um, muscle response, your neuromuscle response. So breathing is connected to it, and this will be my last tip. Um, Actually, before I give you this last tip, I want to say one other thing about about um, recreational runners and hydration. So there's there are so many schools of thought on the amount of, of fluid that you should be taking in when you're running a long distance event, um, whether those should be you know sort of technological developed tech uh, sports performance drinks or just water, salt pills, goos, all these other types of, of um, nutritional supplements that you can take when you're out um, you know running over a period of several hours Um, but the one thing that is really interesting and that you should take a look at if you are a slower running runner is the statistics on the number of, of slower runners that drink too much water as a result of the fact that there are water stops everywhere. So in the New York City Marathon, if you're running New York this weekend, you'll see a water station at every single mile. You see Gatorade at every other mile. Um, And and those are great things. But the thing about the way that our bodies move, especially at this time of year where it's going to be a little chillier on race day, you may not be sweating out all of your fluids. And what you might be doing if you're taking in a ton of water is is when you're peeing out, um, the, the fluid that you're taking in, you might be imbalancing the electrolytes in your system and having too much water with fewer electrolytes can create something called hyponatremia. And that is an overhydration state that ironically has the same exact symptoms as dehydration. 
um, so muscle fatigue and um, muscle spasms, digestive issues, some um, dizziness, and, and those kinds of things are all symptomatic components of both dehydration and overhydration. It really sucks that the, that Mother Nature played that game on us, Mr. Science or Mother Nature or whatever. Um, so just be cognizant of that. Um, so hopefully, again, it's just it, it's an issue as you've trained, you've been you've adapted your running and your hydration practice to your speed and your sweat um, sort of release and and the way that your body reacts to endurance activity, but. It is something that um, that I find remarkable, and because of the types of runners that I work with, the charity runners, the bucket list runners that often take about five and a half or six hours or maybe even longer to complete the race, um, it does uh, it does become an issue because slower runners tend to sweat less. So that's that. But I do want to finish, as I said, with uh, with breathing because the breathing component is such a, a helpful element at the hard part of your, of your day. And again, if you're running a half marathon or you're running a 10 K, the same, same idea can be applicable. The reason I thought about it just now, and the reason I want to end on it is because of the same issue that I was talking about in terms of the um, anxiety level that you have when you go to the start line of any race. And this is really, really important. The, the start line of any race is going to produce some stress hormones in your body. You're going to be anxious. If you're, if you're like completely nonchalant about it, which maybe some people are, um, you know, that's cool. Um, but you're probably not competitive. You're not thinking about it uh, from that perspective. Um, or you've done it so many times, it really just doesn't matter. But most runners are not like that. Most runners have nerves. They've got butterflies in their stomach. They've got some anxiety. They're, they've had trouble sleeping the night before, etc. cetera. Um, breathing connects to that because when you start to fatigue, if your mouth is agape and you are um, breathing in through your mouth, then you're activating that stress response that I was talking about in terms of the... Um, hormones pumping into your bloodstream that affect neuromuscular response, therefore affect your gait, affect your, um, your, your ability to endure the miles. But inhaling through your mouth does the same thing. When you inhale through your mouth, you actually, this is not something that you can control. It connects to the primitive part of your central nervous system. So it activates something called the sympathetic nervous system inhaling through your mouth is like a, um, a desperation response. It's a panic response to the old adage of like fight or flight where you needed to get as much air into your system as possible and you needed your heart and your, your endocrine system needed to pump all those stress hormones into your bloodstream in order to rapid fire your muscle response so that you could you know, run away for something, from something or run towards something. And obviously you're running in a race, but you're not, you're not needing that level of physiological response. You need to remain calm and maintain the, um, the heart rate that is manageable over a period of several hours, which is why nasal breathing comes in and is so, so significant in terms of your ability to get through the wall to get through those periods of time that are more difficult and to help you prepare mentally for the start of the race. When you inhale through your nose, you activate a more executive function of the brain called the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, when air goes in through your nose, it actually filters the air and um, prevents that, uh, prevents that, that stress hormone release into into your bloodstream, into your muscle fibers, and into your, your bloodstream. It filters the oxygen so that the oxygen consumption into your bloodstream is more effective. And that has a significant impact on the ability of the body to continue moving uh, through, through the wall, through each time the pain sort of sets in and you're wondering, you're having to calculate would it be better for me to take a rest and stop running, 
to maybe stop altogether and stretch or do I just keep going? And there are going to be multiple times over the course of a long distance running event where you're going to have to ask those questions. You might not think that you know you're having to make these calculations consciously, but your body is having to make those calculations subconsciously. So breathe deeply, inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth and enjoy yourself. But listen, also have fun. Again, it's the New York City Marathon. It is in two days and we are going to have a blast. We always have such a tremendous turnout, not just for uh, for our runners, as I said before, but for our spectators. It is a beautiful day. It, it's going to be a beautiful day. Mother Nature had her way with us yesterday and um, the sun is shining now and, and I think it's meant to, to do so from here on out through the weekend. A little chilly, but, um, but we're going to have a blast. So if you are around and you're in New York City, I'll be at mile 24, starting in the letter half of the day. I run the race at the beginning, uh, as uh, the rest of the, the coaches from the Team for Kids crew, crew do. I um, jump out of the race course into Brooklyn as it, we get to Brooklyn and take the subway so that I can uh, get, to, uh, get to that point where people start needing some help. So I will be at mile 24, 25-ish, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. I'll be back next week with another new podcast on the In Shape Fitness Show. We'll turn our attention away from running for a bit and, uh, and get back to some basics. Have a great day.